All right, we are looking at premillennialism. Again, what does premillennialism mean in a nutshell? Right, there we go. Before the thousand year reign of Christ, what's going to happen? Jesus returns before the thousand year reign. It's pre, before the millennium, the millennialist, the thousand year reign. Okay, Christ will come back before the thousand year reign. So we've been looking at that through several texts, through the Old Testament, um, through just some of the New Testament, just various texts throughout the Bible. And now we're going to look at it demonstrated by the covenants, the different covenants that God gave. So we're going to look at the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, the Davidic, and the New Covenants. Not in great detail, because there's so much to them, uh, but just to, to prove that even through those covenants, Christ's return is premillennial. All these covenants are both unconditional, meaning they're not dependent on our obedience or fulfillment of certain conditions, and all of them as yet are unfulfilled. Portions of them may have been fulfilled, but for the most part they remain unfulfilled. They haven't happened yet. They're yet future to take place. Let's go ahead and pray and we will jump into this. Father God, we love you. Uh, thank you for this time to be here, Lord. Thank you for the people that are here. God, I love being a part of this church. I love coming here. I love just seeing all the faces that come in and uh, Lord, just watching the kids even take up the offering and just what a joy that is to me. I praise you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. I ask you just to help us, uh, help us take this time as Lord, this is really more of a Bible study than it is preaching. But even with this, I pray we would soak it in, we'd pay attention, Lord. Uh, this is where it is where we begin to learn what we believe and why we believe it. And I just ask you to help during times like this. And God, thank you for the opportunity to stand here and, and preach and teach your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're looking at these covenants here. First is the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is given for the first time in Genesis chapter 12. Most notable is Genesis 12, 15, 17, and 22. It's unconditional, and it's everlasting. So let's, if we would, real quick, turn to Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 1. I'm sorry, verse 7 is what I want. Verse 7. All right, Genesis 17, 7 says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee and their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So God says, This covenant I'm going to establish with you is going to be an everlasting covenant. That means this thing's going to go on forever. Some of its promises have already been fulfilled literally, but two key provisions have yet to be completely fulfilled. So what has been fulfilled? Let's jump up to verse 4. It says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Is that true? Yes, that's been fulfilled. That part of it has been fulfilled. Uh, we sing Father Abraham. I mean, he's the father of many nations. Um, even just the children that came out of him birthed many nations. But even beside that, all the children who've been saved or spiritually belong to Abraham. That's us. He's the father of many nations. Verse 5, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, it just his, his seed just exploded into this huge nation. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And that's exactly what happened. That's been fulfilled. But we get to this last part. It's going to be an everlasting covenant. The part that hasn't been fulfilled it has to do with the seed and the land. This co covenant cannot be abrogated or transferred to the church except by gross spiritualization of the Word of God. Yeah, amen. It cannot amen. be transferred to the church. Some of you, I know, you don't, you're like, what is the big deal with that? It's a very big deal because this is why persecution took place for a thousand years. Because so many said that, well, the church is now... Israel and all the promises given to Israel are for the church so they start persecuting believers that don't believe like them it's a very big deal it messes up all of eschatology all of the end time studies if you will 
All right, we're going to look at some of this. The nation of Israel has a future in God's plan of the ages. According to Romans 11, 7 to 25, Abraham's earthly seed is currently in a state of spiritual blindness. Okay, they're spiritually blind. So let's turn, if we would, to Romans chapter number 11. Romans 11, 25 is what we want. It says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. So here, here it is, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. So Israel is blind in part, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Sion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. All right, so. They're spiritually blind, we see in verse 25. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. This passage that I just read, destroys replacement theology Amen. it destroys it this is where when you get your doctrine say you believe in replacement theology when you get your doctrine if you're going to do exegesis and not eisegesis where okay eisegesis means i'm reading it into it i come with my doctrine in my head and i'm going to find it in the bible i'm going to force it into the bible that's not biblical exegesis is where i come to the bible and i take out of the bible x out of i'm bringing it out of the bible what does the bible say that's what i'm going to believe so if we're going to do proper exegesis, then this passage destroys replacement theology. You have to, that's why we said that the only way you can transfer the covenants from the children of Israel, from the seed of Abraham to the church, is by gross spiritualization of the Word of God. And there's so-called, you know, fundamentalist Bible believers out there that say, we stand on the Word of God, the, you know, the, the literal Word of God, the grammatical interpretation of the Word of God, all that stuff. They say that they stand for that, but they come to stuff like this and they have to spiritualize it because they believe in replacement theology. But this destroys it right here. You, you have to deal with this and what it says. We have to ask ourselves some things. When he says in verse 25, this mystery that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fulfillment, or I'm sorry, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Well, who's Israel? Who are the Gentiles? We've got to ask ourselves, who are these two groups of people? Okay, Israel is the seed of Abraham. Those that came from Abraham's loins are Israel, okay? It went through uh, Isaac and then to Jacob, okay? And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. That's who Israel is, the, essentially the seed of Jacob coming from Abraham, okay? That's the nation Israel. That's who Israel is. The Gentiles is anybody else. Amen. Okay, anybody else is the Gentiles, okay? Verse 25, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from who? From Jacob. Not from the church. By the way, Romans is New Testament. In, in, in the book of Romans, Paul obviously knew about the church. He was the one that the Lord used to reveal all these mysteries of the church, of uh, Christ in you and all that type of stuff, this church age. He's the one that revealed all that stuff. He knew no doubt about the church, yet he still uses all Israel shall be saved, and God's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Doesn't that fit so well with so many of the prophecies we looked at in the Old Testament where it says it's a time of Jacob's trouble. I'm going back to deal with Jacob. I'm going to deal with Israel. It fits exactly what the Old Testament said. And when they had no idea about any church, Amen. they didn't know anything about that. And now you bring it forward, and those that do know about the church, Paul says, no, no, it's Israel. Different. These promises don't get transferred to us. God is still, they're still God's chosen people. Amen. God's not done with them. That's why it's the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. Thy people, remember I was hitting on all that stuff. Who are thy people? Who are Daniel's people? I mean, this stuff is that important. We start replacing ourselves, and this is why it says now we can kill the Jews. Okay, replacement theology in part had a huge hand in the Holocaust and in anti-Semitism all across the world still to this day. 
After all that happened, there's, there's, there's still people that hate the Jews. Why? In part because of replacement theology. Verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them. Them who? When I should take away their sins. Well, their who? Shouldn't it be unto us? This is my covenant unto us? Well, I, I, under, I understand he's quoting, but isn't that what it should say? Isn't that what Paul should be saying? This is the covenant God's put unto us. No, it's unto all Israel. So get this. Here's the clincher. Here's what kills it right here. Verse 28. As concerning the gospel, they, now who's the they? The Jews, all Israel. Jacob, right? As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Whose sakes? Churches, God's people, us. They're enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. I said this destroys replacement theology because, look, if they say that we're Israel, which is what they say, then so we as Israel... Since we replace Israel, so we as Israel are enemies of ourselves for the gospel's sake? Because we preach the gospel, we're enemies against ourselves? Didn't Jesus say a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand? Amen. It, it just doesn't fit when you compare it all with the Bible. See, when you get all the Bible together, that thing just completely falls apart. And it's that important. Verse 28 is the killer right there. As concerning the gospel, they, who the Jews, are enemies for your sakes. So they're enemies because of the gospel, because we preach the word of God. That's what's happened. Abraham's earthly seed is currently in a state of spiritual blindness. We saw that. They're going to remain like that until Christ returns. In verse 26 it says, um, And all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's when it's going to take place. That's when they're going to be saved. Therefore, the complete fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant can only take place after that glorious event, after he comes back. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So he's got to be back to fulfill the covenant. So it's pre-millennial. The Palestinian covenant. This covenant, it's in Deuteronomy 28 to 30. This covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic covenant with respect to the land. It deals with Israel's right to enjoyment of the land, and while it speaks of dispersion through disobedience, it does not void its right of ownership. So they still own the land. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 28, please. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. And verse 45. Deuteronomy 28, 45 says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Let's go to verse 64 as well. Because of their disobedience, okay, all these things are going to come on them. And then verse 64 says, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. So we see God's going to scatter them all over the earth because of their disobedience, but it does not void their right to ownership. Verse 13 of chapter 29 says that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself. He says, I'm still going to establish you as a people unto myself. And that he, he, he may be unto thee a God as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He gave these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I'm still going to keep them. They still keep the promises, though there's punishment and chastisement for their disobedience. It's kind of like we cannot lose salvation even if we sin against God. There may be punishment, chastisement for our disobedience. But we cannot lose our salvation. That's an everlasting promise. God said, I'll give you eternal life. You cannot lose eternal life. These covenants are the same thing. Even though they disobey, God says, I'm going to kick you out of the land. You're going to be dispersed. Isn't that what's happened to them? That's exactly what's happened to them. He said, you're, you're getting booted out. Amen. But now we see the fulfillment of other prophecies, Ezekiel chapter 37, and them being brought back in. Remember that valley of dry bones? The bones are being brought together, and, and it tells us in that text 
Who are these dry bones? It says it's the whole house of Israel. See, God's going back to deal with these people. He's setting things up. It's taking place before our eyes to fulfill what we see in the book of Revelation. It's getting closer. God's setting things up for that. So, just because of their disobedience doesn't mean that they, they lose the covenant. It's, it's an everlasting covenant. The great promise of this covenant is a future restoration. Let's look at uh, Deuteron Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 10. It says in verses 1 and 2, They'll be dispersed. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee. And thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So when you're all scattered out, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey His voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. So once you guys start to get things right, He says, I'm going to turn your captivity. But in that, God's going to return. Verse 3, He says, I'm going to turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations. See, it's a partial of them coming back when he comes back they're really they're all going to be there he's going to bring them in at his return and gather thee from all the nations whither the lord thy god hath scattered thee i don't know exactly how he's going to do it if they'll just as he returns they're just going to be brought there or if right before his turn there's going to be a mass exodus from all over these other nations and that they're just in jerusalem waiting for him i don't know maybe he's going to use the antichrist to round them all up that may be how he does it and just like Hitler did collecting all the Jews in, in Europe, it, that may be the exact way he does it. The Lord can use that to bring them all back into that area, and God's going to return and they'll all be there for him. I don't know exactly how he's going to do it, but I do know he said he's going to do it. Amen. So the Lord will return, and then there's going to be the restoration and the blessings. Verses 4 and 5, If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. So it doesn't matter how far you are out. From the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. Verse 5, And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do to thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. What are they going to do? They're coming into the land which thy fathers possessed. See, just because they're disobedient doesn't mean that covenant's done away with. They still get to keep the land. The land is still theirs. Because God promised it to them. And then their conversion in verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. That's talking about salvation, by the way. That's what it is. That's what it's talking about. Salvation, the circumcised heart. And the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Salvation comes when the Lord returns. That's the premillennial order. We can see it. Now the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, 12, please. Amen. Who's thoroughly lost with where I'm going? Amen. A few of you, you're like, what is he talking about? Yes? No? Everyone gets it? Easy? No? No one wants to answer? All right, we're good. It's okay. That means you're lost. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I hope. Amen. <laughs> Second Samuel 7, 12. This is a message for King David. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Get this, verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. The Davidic covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic covenant with respect to the king. Respect to the king. It is everlasting. We... Saw that right here, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. It's everlasting. You can see that in Jeremiah 33, 20 and 21, Psalm 89, 3 and 4, and 28 and 37. So it's everlasting. It establishes three things forever, a house, a throne, and a kingdom. Verse 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. That's what the Davidic covenant deals with, is the house the throne and the kingdom of David. 
And where did Jesus Christ come from? He came from David. His lineage goes back to David. You've got that in Matthew and Luke, the lineage taking it right back to King David. He's a direct descendant of King David. And he's to sit on that throne. He's going to, and he's going to come back, and he's going to rule. The earthly reign of David and his successors came to an end with the Babylonian captivity, which was the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Therefore, these promises can only refer to a future time and a future king, which will be when the king of kings returns. They're obviously referring to a future time. So, obviously think about it. He says that this promise is to David. This is to you and to your son. And if he messes up, I'll, I'll chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul. He says, I'm not going to take the, the throne from your family, David. It's going to stay with you. Think about what kind of man of God David was for God to tell David that. Because when Saul just blew it and he lost it, it could have been with Saul. I mean, I don't know how God would have worked it out, but it could have been with Saul. That was the first king God chose, but Saul messed everything up. Now, obviously, we know God knows everything and people will say, well, how do you know? No, it was always David. How do you know it wasn't if Saul didn't mess up? And here's where the Calvinists go crazy. Well, God dictated that that's how it was going to be. You sure? Because there's so many times throughout the Bible you can see where man has a free will. We have a free will. We get to choose. God gave Saul opportunities to repent and get things right. He continually rebelled against God, and God finally said, Okay, you're done. I'm done with you. And Samuel's leaving from King Saul because King Saul disobeyed God. He killed the animals that he should have. I mean, he didn't kill the animals that he should have. He left people alive that he shouldn't have. And Samuel shows up, and he's like, Hey, did you obey God, what God said to do? He's like, Oh, yeah, everything he said. Well, what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in my ear? Why do I hear these sheep bleeding? Bah, bah. How come I hear that then if you obeyed God? Because God said to destroy all of it. He said, well, we just kept the best for the Lord. And then Samuel says, no, you're, I'm done. God's done with you. I'm leaving. And he goes to take off and Saul runs and grabs him by the mantle, the bottom of his, his robe, and it rips. And he says, this day, just like my mantle tore, the kingdom's going to be rent from you just like that. And that's what happened. God took it from him. But God gave him opportunities before that to get things right. It could have come through Saul. God could do what he wants. That's what the Calvinists say. And then they say, but no, it, it, that's not gonna, it's not going to happen that way. God decrees everything. He could do whatever he wants except what he didn't do. Well, couldn't he have changed it if he wanted? I mean, if he's all-powerful and almighty, right? I mean, God could have done it that way, but he didn't. So God's telling uh, David, he says, even if your sons mess up, I'm not going to take it from them. It's going to stay with them. My mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul when I put away, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So obviously that talks about a king's got to be on the throne then. So before the millennial reign, the king's coming back to sit on the throne. What kind of throne, what kind of authority is it if the king isn't there? That doesn't even make any sense. All right, the new covenant. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. This is still yet to be fulfilled. This covenant was given to the Jews. It's an extension of the Abrahamic covenant with respect to the blessing of Genesis chapter 12. I'll go ahead and turn there and read that. It says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, in you, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay, because of Abraham, all families of the earth have been blessed, and it's through the new covenant. That's how, through the promised Messiah to the Jews, and we get that blessing. Amen. We get to jump in on that thing. We get to be grafted into that vine. Okay, the unnatural branches get to be grafted into that vine that is God's people. Okay, praise God for that. But this covenant, again, is an extension of the blessing. Salvation is freely offered to Jew and Gentile alike right now. Right now, it's offered to each and every one of us. So, Jeremiah 31, verse 31. 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. By the way, that's what Old Testament, New Testament, that's what it means. It means Old Covenant, New Covenant. So that's what it's talking about. It's the, the new agreement is what God's saying. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. With who? The church, right? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to make it with the house of Israel. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, who's the house of Judah then? If it's replacement theology, who's that then? Can you help me out? Who is that? All right, verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, with, uh, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. What's he talking about right there? Not according to the covenant that, that I made with them, with their fathers, the day I took them out of Egypt. What's he talking about? What is that covenant? No. It's, okay, what happened? Who, who took him out of Egypt? Who did God, who's the man God used to take him out of Egypt? Who was it? Moses, okay. And then where did Moses go for 40 days and 40 nights? Mount Sinai, okay. That, this is the covenant he's talking about. The, when they received the law, that covenant, okay. That's the agreement he's talking about right here. Okay. Uh, verse 32, so... Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husbandman, I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. So that agreement, he said, you're going to keep all these laws, right? They said, yes. Did they do it? No, they didn't. They broke it. Okay, that's what he's saying. He says, it's not going to be like that covenant. It's a new one. But this, verse 33, shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. What's this talking about? What well, we just read right there. When's that going to take place? We just looked at it in a prior covenant. What is it saying? He says, I'm going to, we talked about them circumcising their hearts. When does that happen? Yes, yes it's salvation. When does it happen, though? For, for the nation of Israel. When he comes back. When he comes back. That's what it's talking about right here. This new covenant will fully be fulfilled when he comes back. See, he's got to be here for the fulfillment to take place. So we're looking at this, the new covenant. We looked at those four covenants because they all say, Put a premillennial order forward. They'll say the king has to be back before any of this can happen. So when the new covenant's fulfilled is when the king comes back. Because at that time then he's going to, as he says right here, After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That's when he's going to do it. So salvation is freely offered to Jew and Gentile alike right now. However, the national salvation of Israel will occur at the time of the second coming. Like we saw right there. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. So let's look at a few references right here if we could. Let's go to Romans eleven twenty six, Brother Dominic, can I have you turn there? Brother Francisco, will you go to Zechariah 12, 10? Romans eleven twenty six, and Zechariah 12, 10. Romans 11, 26, Zechariah 12, 10. All right, you there, brother? All right, so, as it's written, this is prophecy, there's going to come out of Zion the Deliverer, and when He comes, He's going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Out of Zion, where is that? Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. It's the old city of David, specifically, is Zion, and that's Mount Zion we talk about. Okay, He's going to come out of there. That's where He's putting His feet down. That's what Zechariah 14 talks about. He's going to set His feet down there, and He's coming out of there to 
deliver and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So it's when he comes back is when this new covenant is going to be fulfilled. All right, now if you would, brother, Zechariah 12.10. So what are they so what are they going to do? They're going to look on him, right? That means he's got to be back. He's got to be back. They're going to look, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they're going to mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. He's going to be back. He'll be back and then the new covenant will be fulfilled. Let's go to Zechariah 13, 9, if we would as well, please. One more spot I want to look at. Zechariah 13, 9. All right, Brother Francisco, will you read that for us? And I will bring the third part to the fire, and I will refine them in silver and silver is refined, and I will try them in gold and fire. They shall call my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Amen. That's what's going to happen. Amen. He says, I'm going to bring the third part through the fire, and we'll refine them as silver is refined, and we'll try them as gold is tried. So a third of them are going to make it through. <laughs> I mean, two-thirds of the Jews are going down. They're going to die. Okay, and he says, I'm going to bring them through the fire. They are, they are going to call on my name. Doesn't it say that? Romans 10, 13, help me out, somebody. Come on, I know it, but do you? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he says right here. And we'll try them as gold, and they shall call on my name. And I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. So he's going to come back. And all this is going to happen. This covenant, the new covenant, is going to be fulfilled at that time. We look at just a few verses over, Zechariah 14, 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And, uh, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst toward the east and toward the west. So his feet in that day are going to stand upon the Mount of Olives. That's in Jerusalem. Again, going back to Romans eleven twenty six, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. See, he's coming out of there. He's coming out of Jerusalem. That's where he's coming out of. That fulfillment of the new covenant is still yet future, but it won't take place until he's back. It's premillennial. The covenants confirm the same thing, the premillennial order. It's also the premillennial, uh, premillennialism is demonstrated by logic. How can there be an age of peace and righteousness without the Prince of Peace reigning? That makes no sense. There can't be. If Christ is not going to come before the millennium, why doesn't the New Testament urge believers to look for the kingdom? Why doesn't it urge us to look for the kingdom? Scriptures such as 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 10 don't speak of a time of peace and righteousness on earth prior to the coming of Christ. I mean, you could lump in 2 Timothy chapter 3, chapter 4 as well. It's not that it's going to get better. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians 1. Because that's what they say. We're going to bring in a, a thousand year period of righteousness and, and everyone's just going to be converted to Christ. And again, that's what the dark ages were all about. I'm telling you, when we get off on our eschatology, when we replace Israel, this, these are the things that happen. We're going to bring it in and we will bring it in at the point of a sword. Today it'll be the point of a gun, the ed, ed, end of a gun. You're going to believe like we tell you to. That's what's going to happen because it's going to be righteousness and peace. And if not, I'm going to shoot you think what that's crazy but that's what's happened that's what the dark ages was about that's what the crusades were about look true christianity had nothing to do with the crusades absolutely zero to do with the crusades don't ever let some ignorant fool or even an ignorant christian tell you that oh well you guys were part of the crusades no we're not not bible believing baptist people were not our forefathers 
Our spiritual forefathers were not part of the Crusades. Our spiritual forefathers never persecuted anybody. They did not. Why? Because we believe in a liberty of conscience. If you want to believe wrong, believe wrong. That's on you. Because I can't answer to God for you. That's where the liberties we have in this country stem from. And because we've forgotten that and we've gotten so at ease where we're at here and all the, the blessings that we have, we forgot why they were fought for and why we have them in the first place, they're, they're disappearing. We're losing them. We're losing them because people don't want to look into it and study these things and figure out why do we even get these liberties in the first place? And they're slipping away from us. We're losing them. We never stood and persecuted others. That's why we believe in a liberty of conscience. Or, or we believe in a liberty of conscience and that's why we never persecuted anybody. Because we believe, just like the Bible says, that as it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, you will stand before God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself before God. Amen. You will answer to God for your actions, for your decisions. I cannot answer for anybody else in this room, not even my wife or my children. I can only answer for me and what I did. And until somebody else, until a government can answer for me, or until a pastor can answer for me, or a friend can answer for me, then it's up to me what I do. And it's up to them what they do. I can't answer for someone else, so I can't tell them, you have to convert to Christ or I'm going to shoot you right now. Convert or die. I don't answer to God for them. They do. That's why the First Amendment is so important. The freedom of religion. The free exercise thereof. Don't interfere. I need free exercise of my religion. Do not interfere with what I believe. Stay out of here. Government has no business inside these doors. Amen. Zero business in here. None. None. I mean none and nothing. Right. In our, the, the books, nothing. None of it. How we do things, who we keep in, who we keep out, nothing. You have no say-so in this. Don't restrict my free exercise of religion. But also the freedom of the press. So I should be able to write whatever I want to write, say it against whoever I want to say it, and the freedom of speech. How else are we going to engage people and convert people to what we believe if we can't engage and speak with them? But if, oh, that's hate speech, well, then how can I talk to you? We have the freedom of speech because people get their feelings hurt. That's why we have it. And they can't go whine and say, well, <laughs> he, he made me feel bad for what he said. No. That's why we have the freedom of speech. It should be protected. Sorry I hurt your feelings, but that's the truth. The truth hurts sometimes. But it's to protect that. So I can do that. So we can engage them, but we don't kill them. We're not on a crusade. That's not us. See all this stuff going on. You got all these Christians having, you know, uh, VBS and stuff and all the youth conferences and things like that. And they're, we're, we're soldiers for Christ. And they put on the whole armor of God and they dress somebody up as a knight and then they put on them a crusade's cross and stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? You do know those people were killing us, right? You do know that, right? You do know those Catholics were killing Baptists like us, right? But hey, let me yoke up with them. Let me be like one of them. Be like them. I mean, I'm telling you, that, that thought process of killing people because they don't believe like we do is alive and well today. Amen. It's alive and well today. Many Christians hold to it because there's a, hist a Christian history revisionism going on. I mean, a lot of Christians will be like, hey, just bomb them, blow them up. I don't want those towel heads over here. Blow them up. Kill them. That's how they are. That's how they act towards them. I'm talking about Muslims. I don't want them here. Kill them. That's the love of Christ, isn't it? That's what he taught us to do. Right. Kill anybody that doesn't believe like you, right? Yeah. That's what it leads to, though, if we get our doctrine off. We're not Israel. We have a new covenant. We're following a new covenant. All right, 2 Thessalonians 1. Uh, 4 through 10 doesn't speak of a time of peace and righteousness on earth prior to the coming of Christ so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer 
Seeing it is, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. It's spoken of as a time of rebellion against God, not a time of blessing and righteousness. It's the complete opposite of that. So, premillennialism is demonstrated by logic. For the believer, Christ's coming, the rapture is imminent. If there was an intervening thousand-year age, the time of the return of Christ would be obvious. All right, we're going to stop right there. Amen. You guys are thinking like, what? We stopped five minutes late still. <laughs> All right, I'm just kidding. It's not late. We don't just get done when we're done. Amen. All right, I hope you're able to follow this. I know some of this is, is kind of, it can be deep. I'm giving you a lot at once. I know that. Some of the things I said, you may not understand all of it. But I want you to understand that we do not replace Israel. Amen. If I, I mean, honestly, in this whole thing, this whole teaching I'm doing on pre-trib, post-trib, if you can walk away with that, that we don't replace Israel, I'll be happy. If you can come away with just that, that we do not replace Israel. And Romans 11, 26 through 28 destroys that idea. We're persecuting ourselves, really, for the gospel's sake. Really, that doesn't even fit with what the Bible says at all, at all. But the mid-trib, post-trib is going to replace Israel with the church. They have to. Again, not everybody, but that they will. That's right, they will. But that's the path you have to go down. Who's all this persecution and everything going on? Who's the focus going back to? Why do we need... 144,000 Jewish witnesses if we're all still here. Why do we need them? Because that's what there's going to be 12,000 from each tribe. Sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses, you got it wrong. There are 12,000 male Jews who are virgins from each tribe. Amen. That's what the Bible describes them as. Why would they be needed if we're still here? But now if we replace Israel, then... Round them up and shoot them. Gas them. Who cares? We're the new Israel. You see? And if all this tribulation and everything that's coming, the, the seven years, the whatever you want to call it, great tribulation, the Daniel 70th week, I mean, stop calling it the time of Jacob's trouble because it's not. It's the time of the church's trouble. But that's not what the Bible says. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's Daniel's 70th week. Thy people, Daniel. Let's pray. Father.